Hi folks, uh, welcome back to the Who is Man module. Um, this is week 11 and it's the second part of part nine. So hopefully you're on the right part. Um, we're, we're considering value and identity. Um, in the module, we've looked at what, what human beings are and said specifically that God designed us that, and that his plan was spectacular and he, he has a, a meaning for human beings that is vastly important. And so you think, well, okay, maybe there's something in what we are. But people aren't so worried about what is humanity worth. They're more interested in what am I worth? What is a human being, a single individual worth? What is my value? And what is my identity? What am I meant for? And so we're considering value and identity. And, and being more specific, what is a person worth? And, and as we were thinking about that, we were thinking about what was paid for you. We were defining value not by um, the standards of the world where we, what, what, can, what people can do for you or, or how uh, many abilities they've got, but actually one of the, the great things about true value is that the value of something is what its purchaser is willing to pay for it and our purchaser is God and he was willing to pay for us with his son and his son is worth more than everything in all of creation because he created everything else and so that's what we're worth we're worth more than everything in all of creation ever so as we're thinking about value and um, we come to the conclusion that our value is based um, not just on what we can achieve but on God's personal valuation of us and um, that we are valuable because he paid for us and we're valuable because he wants us with him and we're his. So then we start to think about identity and the question of identity is even more complicated than the question of value because identity is a made up notion. Identity is how we feel about ourselves, right? Or, or what, what do you think identity means? Is there such a thing as true identity? Is there a reality that we should be aiming for? What is my identity? Oh, I, uh, I, my identity is, um, uh, and we start to think about different things. And that's part of the issue with identity. It's, it's a, a made up notion almost. Um, we come, when we start discussing identity um, to two, two terms where identity is used. Identity is, is used for two things. One, to identify commonality in a group. And two, to distinguish differences from group to group, essentially. Let me explain that as self-identity and group identity. When we're discovering the identity of a species or the identity of a particular type of bird or the identity of this or the identity of that, when we're talking about group identity, we're saying what is the common thing that holds them all together, that makes them all the same? So when we're saying what is the value of a, what is the value of a human being, we're talking about all human beings and we're saying what is their, I, what makes them a human being and what identifies them as human, right? What identifies them as human is the group identity. But then what identifies me as a different human being from you is our self-identity, our individuality, our, our individual identity. And part of the problem that we have is that people then are confusing identity as in well, what makes me special, but, but forgetting that part of identity is being the same as everybody else. And, and so we're questioning what is my identity? What is significant or different about me? What defines me? What is my identity is really a question of definition of, of personality, of, of uniqueness, of, of something like that. And, and the problem is it's too vague a notion. Even when you look up identities on, on the, in dictionaries or in try and understand the term, it's too loose. It's too vague. 
and we, we start to ask the question, well, is there such a thing as true identity? Is all identity just a vague notion? I feel like this and I feel like that. Because that's one of the issues that we have with identity. In modern language, identity is a huge word. People identify as things. Someone identifies as gay or straight or lesbian or bisexual. Some identify as pansexual, which means I have all sexualities. Some identifies as asexual, that I have no sexual identity. Some identify as male, some identify as female, some identify as non-binary gender. And you think all of these things, surely all of that is made up. I, it's, it's, what are we saying? I am this, I am that, I am some. It's concerning, not, I'm not trying to get into gender issues here and I'm not trying to get into um, sexuality issues. Uh, but what I'm saying is that the idea of identifying as something is such a weird notion. I have decided that I feel like this. I define myself like this. And those are the easiest ways to see what people identify as. They're not the only things that we identify as. People identify as different races. Um, there are people who are very black who identify as not black. And there are people who are not black who identify as black. And you think, but you're not African-American, but you identify as black, but you're white. And you're, I, think, I am confused as to what you mean by identity. Does that mean like Eminem, you like to rap and you like hip hop music? And or what, what are you saying you identify as black? Your skin is not black. How do you identify as black? And, and the problem with identity is it's, it's what I feel and what I think. And, and certain um, identities are allowed by law encouraged by law, you know, the, the freedom to choose in, in lots of laws is great, but in some laws, no, you know, you can't identify as that. I can't identify as a goat. In some, um, when it comes to council tax, I would like to identify as goats because goats don't pay council tax. I don't know. And that's my problem. What do we define and, and, and how do we decide what I feel like I am, or how I define myself. Am I the best person to identify myself? When we come to group identity, it is the observer who identifies the identity, the commonality, the themes that connect a group. And this is where I, I get frustrated. So if a child has a high voice who, and waves their arms a lot, um, then they're gay. Well, no, they're not. I could understand if you said they're, they're quite a camp person, but the fact that they have a higher voice and wave their arms a lot does not define their sexuality. The observer has put upon them, and very often uh, a lot of people are encouraged to be gay because of their style. And I think, but some of those people are, are not same-sex attracted which is the real definition of what gay is. I hope I'm not getting too much involved in identity issues. Uh, my, my goal is to aim away from that, um, but to use identity issues to try and explain the confusion we have over identity. The, the fact is that people claim identity based on so many different things. Um, it's less obvious perhaps when people identify with a certain job or with a certain skill set or ability. I'm a musician. There are people who identify as musicians who are terrible at playing any instrument and can't sing a note. I may be one of those. <laughs> but we identify as something. We identify, I identify as being a world-class football manager because I'm very good at the, the computer game football manager, 
but I have never done what Neil Warnock, who lives just down the road here, has done and won promotion 15 times and, and managed teams for, for 50 years and done a brilliant job. He's a real football manager. I identify as a good football manager, but he actually is. And the problem with identity is that either the individual or the observer is trying to define the, the value, the character, the, the personality, the uniqueness of the, the observed parties. When, whether that's a group or a single person, um, we're trying to identify, which is why identity is so closely attached to identify um, who that is or what that group is. And the problem with identifying things is that what you identify and what I identify will be different things. What you identify with about yourself and what I identify about you will be two different things. I might think you're great and you might think you're terrible. I might think that you have amazing skills on the drums and you might think that you always play a bum note. You see, we identify or feel or struggle. It's hard to play a bum note in drums. What am I talking about? But anyway, uh, we identify or, or with, with whatever we feel and an observer will identify different things. And so the question is, is there truth with identity? Is there a real identity for you? And we we come to the question, well, well, if I decide, surely then whatever I decide is my true identity. And yet, actually, you're not the best identifier of identity. When it comes to truth, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. What I define is truth. I'm the very center of all truth. All that really is told is really told about me. All that really matters and all that is eternal is based on me. What man is meant to be is me, Jesus is saying. I am the truth. I am the truth for humanity. I'm the truth for life. I'm the truth for eternity. I am the answer. I know and what I know always was, always is and always will be. Therefore. Everything I am and I say is truth. That's why he says, truly, truly, I tell you, or verily, verily, depending on which uh, scripture you read. Um, uh, truly, I tell you such and such, because what he says is truth. He defines truth. Therefore, when we come to identity, the one truth that we can hold on to is the truth of what Jesus identifies you as. So true identity is going to come in Jesus. The issue is that everybody has their own opinion on who you are and what you're worth. But at the end of time, God judges on who you are, what you've done, how you've been, and his version of your identity. He compares the things that you've decided and you've felt like and, and the way you've treated yourself with his knowledge and his understanding of who he made you to be and who he remakes you to be in Christ. And so the actual truth is that your identity is God's. God's to define the value of a human being and the identity of a human being only makes sense in God's eyes. That's why when we sing about surrender, we say, because it's in your will that I'm free. It's in your will that I have real identity. It's in your will that I find truth. It's in God that we are who we're supposed to be. And so the identity issue of whether there is a true identity um is challenged by the truth issue. Is there such a thing as truth? If God is true, if he defines truth, if he eternally holds things together and therefore shapes truth, then there is a truth to who our identity is. And it's not in our abilities 
It's not in what we like. It's not in what makes me different from the next person. It's in Christ. Our identity isn't about what we enjoy or, and, and that's where particularly sexual motivation frustrates me because people can live all sorts of lives and have all sorts of sexual backgrounds at the same time. Uh, recently, there's been stories of a, a famous Bible teacher who's been abusing women for years. And it was only found out very recently. And we're saying, but he is identifying as a Bible teacher, but here is his reality of, of abusive man. And he's hiding one identity behind another identity. And yet the truth is always God's. And remember what God wants to define you as, what true identity is. The true identity for you is who God made you to be. Not the failed sinful man that we saw in, in state two, but the redeemed man and eventually the heavenly man. That is God's identity for you. That's who he sees you being. That's who he identifies as his children, who he calls by name. It says in, in Revelation that he'll give us a new name, a white stone with a new name on it, known only to us and to him, who he really identifies us to be. You see, we identify in so many different things, and then we mix up our identities and we hide our identity from one thing to another. And we claim a certain identity and hide another one. And, and it's so confusing. And yet the true identity of a human being is in redemption in Christ. Because if you're a redeemed person, that's a secure identity. And by secure, I mean eternal. The problem with lots of identity is that it's temporary. I once identified as a footballer. I know that's hard to believe when you look at me now as a 43-year-old man with dodgy legs who can't run the length of the pitch. But one day in the past, I thought I was quite good. But that identity changes because my skill set changes. Same is true of other sports or other games or other hobbies or other things that I've done or tried Sometimes I'm good at them and sometimes I'm not. Maybe now I think I'm a Bible teacher. And yet maybe in the past I was rubbish at it. Maybe in the future I'll be rubbish at it. And maybe right now I'm not that great either. And all of this is down to skill sets that change, identifiers that change. How many people still live with their primary identity as a sexuality when they're beyond an age where they're physically able to commit the sexual act. That's freaky for me because they're still claiming an identity based on something that they don't even do anymore. Or the, the frustration for me is often at the other end is children, labels are put on children that they're gay when they're not even old enough to understand sexuality, never mind be in a place to be committing sexual acts. And yet six and seven year olds are identified as gay. I'm not picking on people for sexuality, but what I'm saying is identity, the way we measure it and the way we see it changes so much. And it changes by how we want it to be and what we feel like and not reality. I mean, genuinely, I get frustrated singing along with people who can't sing but think they can. And I'm not complaining. I, I want people to enjoy it. Some of my favourite times of worship have been standing beside a guy called Mark McCune, who's now a minister in Glasgow, who couldn't sing but knew he couldn't sing. But the two of us would stand there and praise God. And we would both enjoy it, me because he was loving it and he didn't care.
because I was loud and he could be in the background and let me welt it out. And I would sing as loud as I could so I wouldn't hear him. And he would sing as loud as he could so that he could join in and the two of us would worship. And yet I would identify as a singer and he would not. And maybe people would rather listen to him than me. Our problem with identity is it's so temporary and so artificial. It's based on how we feel. So when we connect value and identity, we end up really confused. And yet they're very intrinsically linked. They're supposed to be linked because God's idea of identity, our true identity in Christ, sorry, I need to not click that, but our true identity in Christ is about being remade by God in Christ's image and being new, being renewed men, having a new goal, having a new heart and a new spirit in us. God's going to take the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. And our identity is supposed to be that. That is the primary thing that makes us real. And the thing about that identity is it's eternal. It goes to the past. Before we asked, before we repented, God had already decided that's who we were going to be. Before any of us were born, all of our days were written in his book before one of them came to be. And yet it's also true in the future. It always will be. In heaven, there is no sexuality. There's no being given or taken in marriage. There is no sexuality. It's not an eternal identity. My frustration with all of the, the things that people identify, I mean, if, if somebody identifies as their job, I am a statistician. Well, very good, but one day you'll retire. Oh, but then I'll be a retired statistician. Yeah, you'll still think in numbers. But is that really who you are? I'm a Baptist minister. Ooh, very good. I'm friends with a retired Baptist minister. Ooh, very good. But is that our identity? It's a great opportunity. I, I'm not here because I, I get to be a minister. I'm here because I want to reach people. I'm here because I want to encourage people. I want to hear because I want to help people. If I identify as a minister, then when somebody says, oh, you've done a good job with that sermon, then that validates my ministry. That validates my identity. And I feel good. And if somebody says, you've done a bad job there. I didn't enjoy that sermon today. I don't agree then I feel bad and I feel like my identity is challenged and I question it all. But my identity is not by how I feel, what my job is, how good I am at something. Because God doesn't pick on the day when I've done badly and say, you did badly, or pick on the day when I've done well and go, oh, very good, you've done a great job there, in a patronizing way. I'm not suggesting that people are being patronizing when they say I've done well, by the way. Uh, but God doesn't do that. He has identified me as his child. And whether I struggle to tie my shoelaces or get it first time is not the point. Whether as his child, I run around and dance and sing or sit quietly and read a book. Those are, are styles. And God likes different styles. We'll come to that next in the next section. But my identity is his child, primarily my relationship and my, my um, recreation in God are the things that make me, me. And that true identity is the eternal stuff. And that means when it comes to my value, God can define my eternal value and therefore connect my identity with my value. One of the problems with... Um, the disconnect between identity and value is that we become hypocritical. If I value myself because I'm good at something and then I do badly at it, I start to feel like I am not me. I start to feel let down by myself. The same is true of others. If I identify someone as a good listener and then they won't listen to me, 
then I have this disconnect and I, they have failed to be what I identify them as. And the problem with identity is that there's expectation that goes with identity. And we connect value and identity. And when there is disconnect, identity and value, neither of them really makes sense. Value maybe still makes sense, but it doesn't feel real. When somebody says to you, God died for you and you're worth everything, but you don't experience that, you don't live that out, you don't grab hold of that, then you feel disconnected and you don't identify as loved by God. And it leads to a whole lot of issues in your faith and a whole lot of issues between you and God. Because he says, I love you. And you say, but you can't love me. I'm not nice. The the identity that we have and the value that we have must connect. Otherwise, we feel dissociated. That's where a lot of mental health problems come from, is the, the not feeling like we're, I'm not what I'm supposed to be. I'm not what I'm supposed to be. I'm not what I am. And, that, and you think, but that doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't make sense because your identity and your value have got disconnected. So identity and value must go together, but they go together in Christ. God's eternal identity, uh, he identifies you eternally by his definition, who you are in Christ. If you identify as other things, then when your identity and who he says you are don't match, your connection with God gets lost. But also your identity of yourself needs to be in how he sees you, not because of your abilities and skills, but because of his valuation of you. Because there's a security in that and a permanence in that. He is faithful. And therefore, his valuation of you and his identification of you are faithful and long and loving and perfect definitions. That's who you'll be in heaven. And so our identity and value must be connected and they must be connected in God. Otherwise, we end up with quite a false identity. And there's two things that make a false identity. Things that deny Christ or things that find identity elsewhere. First of all, the things that deny Christ. The, the problem with a lot of uh, things we identify is it's sin. And sin says, God says, do this, and I'm saying no. And in doing that, we turn from God's identity quite obviously. And then we will have a, a disconnect with God and a disconnect from our real value and a disconnect from our real identity. So there are people who, who really claim identity and focus identity on things that deny Christ deny his reality. One of the things I struggle with when it comes to gender, for example, is that we have chromosomes that tell us our gender. So if I choose something, I'm denying the very inside of me, the very cells that my body's made up of, and the very manufacture of God. Now, as I've said before, our value doesn't go back to what we're made from. It goes to what we're being made into. So actually, it doesn't essentially matter what we were made from or what our cells say. But I find it difficult that people can deny the reality of that, the pieces of their body, and say, no, I don't like the pieces of my body. So therefore, they're not pieces of my body. And I'm like, but they're still connected to you. They still are. There's pieces of my body I don't particularly like either. Uh, my face being one of them, but it's still my face. I can't not identify as this face. When I look in a mirror and walk away and think, I look like Brad Pitt. Uh, that's called mania or psychosis or something, some kind of not right kind of thought, isn't it? So one of the problems with identity is when we identify in things that are sin, that deny what God has defined, the real truth but just as damaging and often more damaging are the things that we find identity in that are secondary things that are non-issues. 
a lot of people identify, especially in Scotland, with what football team they support. Do you support Rangers or Celtic? No, I support St. Mirren. Just you remember that. But with the Rangers and Celtic thing, there's an identity as a as part of a community, whether it's Protestant community, whether it's Catholic community. It's a, an identification with a certain religious upbringing and so on, a different type of school and all this identity. But all of it is unreal. All of it is secondary. Are you connected with God or not is, is the question that really matters. Likewise, when people identify by sexuality, sexuality is a non-issue. It's not a point. There's some horrific sexual behavior that goes on. And I'm not having to go at anybody for any particular type. It's, it's, but it's a non-identity. In eternity, it doesn't exist. The behavior that we get up to is, can be good or bad, even in relationships that are, are, are biblically correct. It isn't the point of whether we're doing it well or badly. It's where we're finding identity. Your sexuality should not define you. I've lived 43 years without having sex. Um, I know that's weird and unusual. Um, I'm not recommending it to everybody else. But what I'm saying is that sexuality has not defined me, will, will not define me. And I, I'm not saying I'm great and you aren't because I've got that. I have other things that I find identity in. Like I said, even the, the games that I'm good at, I like to think I'm good at games. Really, it's, it's my identity in that, being the best at something. I did really well in football manager um, and I was the 70,000th best player. Wow, that's pretty tragic, isn't it? And I look for my identity in this or that or the other thing. I, I used to get really frustrated when people said Andy Murray wasn't making the most of his talent because he was only the fourth best tennis player in the world. He's only the fourth best out of seven and a half billion people. Oh, dear me. And then he gets to number one and then he's number one for very long. And they say, you see, he didn't do And I'm thinking... He's done incredibly well. He's won three Grand Slams. He is an excellent tennis player. If he identifies as a tennis player, I understand that. And yet we identify in all sorts of things. And even if, I, if, even if Andy Murray is identifying as a tennis player, he's missing the point of who he really is as a human being. As a human being, first of all, we're defined by God. First of all, we're defined by our relationship with God. That's our real identity because that's the eternal stuff. Everything that's not Jesus is a distraction from that. And I'm not picking on any particular distraction. I'm not having a go and say you can't try this or you can't do that. But finding your identity in it is missing the point. Our identity our value is defined by God. The value of something is what its purchaser is willing to pay for it. And the identity of something is what the right person's opinion of identification of it is. The problem is that we think there's some truth because we can measure certain things. And we say, well, that's what that is, and that's what that is. And we can observe things. But our observation is secondary to God's observation. And so everything that Jesus doesn't define is, is not the point. So first of all, we shouldn't be denying Christ by our identity, but second of all, we shouldn't be distracted by it. And we miss out on our real value when we miss out, when, when our real value and our real identity are disconnected. What we feel like is not what God says. That's where identity and value miss out. And then we feel like we're missing something. Either we feel like we're not enough or we're something that God doesn't like or there's a problem. And we need to, first of all, and primarily emphasize who we really are, our real identity in Christ. So identity in Christ is a very 
key issue. Um, and there's a whole identity in Christ program you can do. Um, but everything that's not Jesus gets us lost. And it makes us feel disconnected from our value. And one of the things that I, I just want to encourage Christians, where I assume most of the people who are doing this module are, um, to be careful about is how we often present a false front. We identify as being a good Christian. And by that, we identify as having less faults than everybody else. And that's unreal. That's a disconnect from who God says you are. God says you're a sinner saved by grace. You are a renewed person. You are a new man. You're redeemed. But we're not faultless. And people put up a false front about all sorts of things, especially those secondary things that our identity is not in. And they say, well, I do that right. I've got that better than you. Or they point out faults in somebody else and they say, they've got that wrong. That part of their identity is not what God says it should be. That is something we need to be very careful of. We stick to the primary identity, the primary valuation of who a human being is, and that's how Jesus sees them. And he sees them as the ones he died for. And he loves each of us very much. And his opinion of who we're supposed to be is heavenly and beautiful and lovely. And sometimes we identify as skilled in that place. I struggle with it in different aspects. There's some who think they're so spiritual, they'll tell you what God says. And sometimes what they say is nothing like what God says. I've read the Bible enough times and I've gone through it enough times to know that that is not the voice of God. Others identify as I'm very good at this or I'm very skilled at that. I'm a worship leader. I'm a preacher. And you think, but God, I didn't identify you as that. That's not his identity for you. And by you promoting the skills that he's given you and the sets of, of abilities that he's given you, the talents that he's given you, you're missing out on the point. You're supposed to be connected with him and in love with him and having a relationship with him and focused on that identity and value. I've seen a lot of people hurt, essentially is what it comes down to, by misunderstanding um, what they're good at and saying, well, what, I'm good at that, that's my identity. And just being good at it, even Christian things, is not identity. Your identity should be in Christ. That's the definition of identity, who God made us to be, because that's a permanent identity. That's an identity that lasts forever. And when we start to identify with the skill sets or the abilities in the church, that's worse. That's putting people off finding their real identity. The fact is that one of the things that we can offer the world as the church is real identity and real value. Why do people blow themselves up for Islam? It's because they think they get something, an identity and a value out of it. If I do this, then I will go to heaven and I will have 70 virgins, virgins who will have sex with me and stay virgins and I will have a great eternity. And they're identifying because they see something that they want and something real. Well, what we offer is real identity, permanence and value in heaven in Christ, not made up, but not unreal, truth defined by God. And the fact is that people are searching for identity. That's why they go looking in different places. That's why they say, well, I've got this ability, so that's my identity. Or I enjoy this kind of sex, therefore that's my identity. Or I am this kind of happy person, so I'm going to be this. Or I want that, so that's what I'm going to consider my identity. They, they're looking, they're searching for something real and, and valuable and permanent and somebody to say, this is who you are. And we have the true message. This is who you are. You're loved by God and there's a place in heaven for you. Don't get so caught up in people's attempts to define their identity to miss what is really important 
their identity in Christ. Help them find that. Don't, don't let the other stuff become the center of what we discuss. It isn't the center of what we discuss. It's secondary things. We are either in Christ or not in Christ. We are either in Christ, not in Christ, and will become in Christ, or we're never going to be in Christ. God sees us as valuable, and he died for us. And so he wants us to find our real value, our real identity. And that's something that people miss the most. And as we understand people's value, the hope that we have is that we can share that with them and help them realize their real identity. And that identity of hope is a huge thing. Very often people choose an identity because they hope it will mean something. So let's focus on um, what identity and value really mean. There's a truth in identity that God identifies us. And I like it when he says in, in Isaiah 43 that he calls us by name. I have called you by, by name. He identifies us individually. And being precious and honored in his sight, as it says later in Isaiah 43, being precious and honors in, in his sight. And because he loves us, he considers us special and valuable and identifies us as his children. First John 3 verse 1 says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, identified as children of God. And that is what we are. That is our identity. Right? Children of God, that is the primary identifier in Christ. Let's not get distracted by the other things. Let's be aware that people are searching for identity and value. And then let's use what we do know to share with them the message that real identity is found in Christ. And, and let's let that be the focus for what we are. What is a human being? Well, in God's eyes, it, it's his child that he's called. That's who he wants us to be. That's the best identity there is for us. That is our absolute value in Christ. So let's find that and let's encourage others to be the same.